what matters, what doesn't matter, okay? Uh, and once you figure that out, I think you're in a much better position to lead yourself and, and then to lead, to lead others, okay? And any comments about this self-reflection? Any thoughts on this? To my left? Oh, okay. Hi. What's my, your name? I'm Allison. Allison? I'm a management major. Okay. So I was kind of wondering, what is the transition between self-reflection and self-improvement? You kind of just touched on it on the last part, part yeah. of your self-reflection where you talk about how can I be better tomorrow. Yeah. But although I agree, I think sometimes just identifying the problem is over half of the obstacle and you can yeah. improve just based on that. How would you suggest moving forward when you're finding the same patterns in your self-reflection and holding yourself accountable for making the changes? Super question, super question. So a couple thoughts for you. Uh, and I, I'm summarizing, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing each of these four for you, right? In my classes, I spend about three or four hours on each one of these, right? So you give me the opportunity to expand for a minute a little bit of the self-reflection. Because the whole purpose of self-reflection, in my mind, is to become self-aware and, and to know yourself, to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Now, you raise a great point. So there's, there's really two parts to this. I only gave you the first part which is yourself. The second part, major important part, is, Allison, you've got to find a few people that you can continuously talk about this and bounce this off to, to hold yourself accountable, right? Uh, the way my wife Julie would say it is, Harry, left to your own devices, you could convince yourself of anything. Do you want to know what I think? Now, the answer to that question after 38 years is yes. You may not think it's yes, but it's always yes, okay? Trust me, it's yes. Um, and what I would say is whether it's a significant other, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a best friend, finding people you work with, finding people who will make sure you don't fool yourself, right? So here's the example, Allison. Let's say you and I are working together, and I say to myself, well, this is a great lady, good values, very open, honest. You know what? I'm going to take you to lunch and say, hey, Allison, I want to share some things with you. I want to share some things that are really important to me in terms of these values. Well, this is great because now I get a chance to get your reaction, right? Now, let's look at the range of possible reactions I could get from you, right? I'll give you from the good news to the bad news. The good news is you say, Harry, stop. I've been working with you for three years. I see your actions every day. I could have guessed your values. I mean, you're not, I, mean I get it. It's, it's fantastic, clear. Now, the other side's a little more dangerous, right? The other side is when you say, Allison, wow. Based on your actions, I'm amazed you're deluded enough to think those are your values. You're, you're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You're like two different people, right? Now, to get that kind of feedback from a number of people, because I would do this from four or five people, then you can start to kind of assess what, what's the real world. What's the real world? Then the last part, Allison, I think is important. Um, I've had some students that will say, oh, boy, you know, I don't think I could do this every night because, boy, when I think about the things that didn't go well, you know, maybe a little hard to go to sleep or whatever, right? Well, the way I think about it is a little different. I think about it as, okay, so last night at midnight I thought to myself, okay, what went well today? All right, that's great. Pat yourself on the back. The things that didn't go well, okay, why didn't they go well? And what could I do to improve? And the reason I don't get too hung up on it, once again, it's, it's, it's my wife, Julie, who said to me 38 years ago, Harry, you're never going to be perfect. I'm well aware you're never going to be perfect. So, you know, try to be the best you can be. And it's not complacent, but it's never going to be perfect, right? And that's why you try to do the right thing, you do the best you can do. And what it does, Elsa, it just puts it all into perspective. Puts it all into perspective. Make sense? Okay. Another question? Oh, yes. What's your name, sir? Jack. Jack. How did you overcome your fear and failure? How did I what? Um, well, I, I think this self-reflection, Jack, I started this so early that, that I was still in school when I started this. And I, I convinced myself, the only thing I know that's going to happen is I'm going to occasionally fail. It's a little bit like the gentleman over there mentioned. See, if you think you're never going to fail, then it's a real big deal. If you say, I'm going to sometimes fail, and I'm going to use that as a learning. In fact, I don't know if you guys have gotten to the point, Jack, when, the times when you learn the most is actually when you fail, all right? And some would almost argue, if you never fail, well, how do you grow? How do you grow? 
And I had one actually young woman say to me, boy, it sounds like failure is pretty important here. I, I have a real problem. I said, what's that? I've never failed. Is that a problem? Well, it's actually a fantastic question, OK? So here's my response. I'll use it for all of you folks. We've got a lot of very bright people in the room. If you've never failed, if you've never failed, Jack, I think one of two things is true. Either you've been unbelievably lucky. OK, well, say a prayer, boy. You, you're incredibly lucky. But here's the key question, Jack. If you've never failed, is it because you're just incredibly great? Oh, here's a good example. You're a student, and you say, if your grade's on a, what, on a 4.0 scale, whatever, somebody says to me, I have a 4.0 grade average, OK? Do you have a 4-point average because you're brilliant? Or do you have a 4.0 average because you never took a risk? You never took a class from a professor you weren't sure you were going to get an A in. See, because if you've never failed, and the first time you fail is when you're like 35 or 40 years old, it's going to be a long way down. But if you kind of view it as, sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Sometimes it's going to work out, and sometimes. And when we fail, OK, two, two questions. What did you learn, and how do you apply that to minimize the chance that that failure doesn't happen again? It's all a process. It's all a process. You have one more over here? One more. One more. What's your name? Just shout it out. So I know you touched on like leaders surround themselves with people and they hope you should come up with a great solution, but they have to recognize it when they find it. Mm -hmm. How as a leader are you able to recognize that and find it? That's a that's a good question. I I, I kind of think of it as if if you listen carefully and you get a lot of different opinions, if you read a lot, you're, you're constantly understanding why, the way different people do different things, and you're open, and you don't have to have the answer yourself. When you listen to something, some, for me, I'll say, geez, I'm not sure what to do. And then you'll say something, and I'll ask you a couple of questions, and I'll say, you know, that makes a lot of sense. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's the right answer. But as we said before, it may not be. It may not be, as said to Patrick, and if not, then I have to correct and do, and do something different. So in, in my mind, you try to get, when I say, you try to get as much input you can from as many people as you can. And when you listen, you say, you know, I think, I think that could be it. And if it isn't, we'll do something different. Okay? So last comment I make to everybody, no pressure, but you are those guys. So good luck. Okay? So Mr. Kramer has to drive back to Chicago tonight, but I'm sure you take a few questions after we're through here. So in my self-reflections tonight, I'll be, one of the things I'll be thinking about is thanking the Clearys for the gift of you. I really appreciate their very much, the Clearys doing what they do. And also, um, the right-hand woman to the Clearys is Jana Knights, and so she's also been very helpful. Um, we also want to thank <laughs> the foundation, including Jay Scott and Sandy Sieber, SBDC with Ann Lavaca, Marie Reber, Corrine Reinick from the CBA Dean's Office and the CBA Student Ushers for tonight, this wonderful event. These things look simple, but I assure you they are not. Um, and again, a thank you to you for coming to visit with us today. It's been a wonderful fourth Cleary Lecture Series event. <laughs> We look forward to seeing you at August events like this in the future as we move in to celebrate CBA's 50th anniversary in 2020-2021 and as we move into CBA's new home, the newly remodeled Wittick Hall at that point. So I want to thank you for coming and I want to thank you for, I want to th uh, tell you to enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again. Thank you.